Hello and welcome on France 24. We are in Geneva in Switzerland for the Africa CEO Forum. And my guest is Mo Ibrahim. Thank you so much for being with us. You're from Sudan. Uh, you founded the telecommunication giant uh, Celtel. You sold the company in 2005 for $3.4 billion dollars and then you created your foundation the Mo Ibrahim Foundation to improve governance and leadership uh, in Africa. It's the third edition of Africa CEO Forum here in Geneva. For three years, we've been really saying that Africa is the new frontier, but there are so many different countries. Uh, some collapse with the Ebola disease, uh, others uh, face terrorism and war, others are in better shape, but with low development. Have we been over optimistic, you think? Uh, I always try to move away from uh, this sort of, of, of uh, 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 general branding of Africa. I, sometime we say it is Africa is a basket case. Then we say Africa is the uh, rising story or the frontier rising for investment. Africa. The uh, new frontier. The frontier. I think in the foundation we had a position. We always said that we should move away from these two narratives, uh, Afro-pessimism and Afro-optimism uh, uh, to Afro-realism. So what is Afro-realism? Afro-realism is just we need to look at what's going on and understand Africa is not one country. It is 54 countries. It's very difficult to stick a label to 54 countries. Countries are different. We have countries which are moving successfully, doing very well. Which ones? We have countries, yeah, we have Mauritius doing fine, we have Namibia is doing well, we have Ghana is okay, we have uh, Nairobi is moving up, we have, we have, you know, Tanzania is not bad. We have many countries, Rwanda is doing well. Uh, many countries are moving forward. And uh, at the same time, we have some countries which is almost collapsing. We have South Sudan today in a failed state, frankly. Uh, Libya is a fa failed state. Uh, we have problems in Nigeria. I mean, this guy, is Boko Haram, just, it just became really a serious, a serious problem for not only Nigeria. For, uh, uh, so, unfortunately, Ebola hit some countries and, and, and also caused, caused a, a lasting damage, actually, because not only the terrible death of people, but also what does to the economy of the country. So what we need is a realistic view of Africa. It's just like anywhere else. Uh, we have countries moving forward, we have countries moving backward, we have countries moving sideways. So we should not be lazy and stick just one label to 54 countries and walk away. Not one label. Oh, you created this uh, Ibrahim Prize for Achievement in African Leadership. The prize recognizes excellency in African leadership. That is to say, leaders who dedicate their job to face development challenges and improve livelihoods of their people. For seven years, Mo Ibrahim, nobody got the prize. This year, someone got the prize. President of Namibia, President Pohamba, how did you choose him? Why him? Why Namibia? Yeah, let me just say two or three facts. First, uh, we, it's about seven or eight years since we launched the prize. We had four winners, out of which is a very good uh, ratio of success. It is a prize for excellence. It's not a pension. Excellence is rare. Uh, we are very happy for, for the prize committee decision. I'm not a member of the prize committee, so I have not chosen the, the, the president, but I think the committee made a good decision uh, because here is a humble president who came to power and uh, who is a president by consensus, tried to uh, really hug the opposition and bring them. You reconcile opponents? Uh, reconciliation is very important and we need to move through this narrative uh, yes, we have democracy, but democracy means winner takes all. If I win 51% of the vote, you are my opposition, you win 49%. 49% of the people supported you. I must be mindful of this. I cannot just exclude you and, 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 and this mentality of winner takes all doesn't work. Uh, we need more collaborative uh, uh, process. And actually not only us, even the United States, I think, need to learn also from that, uh, this culture of, of winner takes all, too much uh, bipartisan. 
So the Namibian president gave a very good example there. He made education free, which enabled all the kids to go to school, which is, is great because really the young generation is, is, is very important. Move the economy forward. So it's, it's wonderful and, and it's simple. It's, it's, you know, we hope more people do this basic stuff which move the country forward. Now, some people say uh, his anti-corruption policy did not make any change in the country. You disagree with that, probably? I don't think so, because I, I, Namibia corruption really is, is, is quite low. You know, Namibia in, in general is a well-governed country. It has been always in the top five of our index uh, of good governance. It's a small country as well, and you've been citing small countries as uh, success stories in Africa. Do you need to be a small country in Africa to succeed? It seems to me, probably it helps if it's a smaller country. Why do you to think manage, it's maybe. easier to manage? Uh, probably, is, is, is given the diversity and the uh, uh, diversity Because in it means ethnics. also a smaller market if you're a small country. This is true. It's true. Smaller markets and so economically disadvantaged in that sense. But from governance point of view, maybe it is easier when you have a more homogeneous uh, uh, population and less, less of the religious, ethnic diversity and competition in the country. Maybe this make the uh, uh, it do some relaxation in the political tension in the fabric of society. Maybe it makes it easier. One thing we look in the foundation, we're looking also about the link of the population with the success of governance. We do, we're trying to do some analysis and we hope we'll come up with some, some results of that because that's a good point to raise. Nigeria, uh, is it a lesson for Nigeria? It's still very badly ranked. Uh, why do you think? It's the second biggest country in Africa, second largest market. It's, it's really sad. It's really sad. I mean, uh, uh, Nigeria is a very interesting country, very thriving population, very entrepreneurship, huge amount of energy, big market. Somehow, the political elite in, 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 in Nigeria, and I'm not taking sides because I cannot take sides. It is just the political elite, which whatever parties they are, who consistently let their people down. And, uh, in doing what? In not taking care of the, the people? Yes, the institutional corruption in Nigeria is just huge. And uh, the reluctance of governments to come clean, to introduce transparency, is not helpful. I, I was dismayed this week when I heard that the uh, forensic financial audit carried out by Pricewaterhouse on the oil account uh, was not being published. So why, why is that? We had somebody like the governor of the central bank making certain allegations uh, about a huge corruption. You mentioned, I think, 20 billion or something. The government responded or the oil company responded and said, no, it's only one and a half billion, which is still too much. But then they said, okay, we're going to have a forensic audit. They carried the audit. They need to publish the information so we really know what, what exactly is happening. Transparency is very important. And uh, I think the, the political elite in, in, in Nigeria really uh, uh, failed badly in, in, in moving the country forward. Africa's growth is 5% uh, in uh 2015, what do you think would be the impact of the drop of uh, oil price and commodity price, actually? Uh, no doubt it will have an effect. But the fact is the, the commodities uh, contribute to less than 30% uh, for African uh, 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 development. Uh, uh, you know, the growth rate of Africa, uh, only less than 30% was commodities related. Other sectors of the economies are also moving, especially services and industry. So th things may slow down a little bit because Africa is not isolated from the international, from the global economy. But still Africa will produce positive results. It still is going to score uh, in the 4% maybe or, or around that uh, uh, growth rate, which is not bad given 
the, the lack of growth really you see around the, around the globe. Around the globe, so it's not bad. So, so you founded, uh, I said earlier, the giant uh, Celtel. What, what's the next step uh, for the phone industry in Africa, you think? Africa is hungry. Africa is hungry for many things. Uh, we have a huge middle class coming out now and developing. And this huge middle class need housing, need services, uh, need consumables. That's, that's huge. Uh, telecom, a good job is done in telecom. Africa now have like 500 million mobile phones, more mobile phones than in Europe. Uh, but the next step is going to be the broadband because people need proper access, cheaper access now to broadband. And that's important. We need to think of broadband now as an essential part of, of, of infrastructure. When people talk about infrastructure, people talk about electricity, which we need, uh, roads and rail, which we need. But broadband is not less important than that. It's really important. That's the highway of the future. Broadband is the future of Africa. Uh, I think so it's very important. For you welcome all investors all for that. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much for being my guest. Thank Moe you. Ibrahim. Thank you very much for Thanks having me. Thanks to you for watching and stay with us in France 24.